Thank you and good evening. And welcome to the second event in the 2010-2011 Speaker Series here at California State University, Monterey Bay. I'm Diane Harrison and I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker this evening, artist Jeff Shang. Mr. Shang teaches Asian American Studies and Photography at the University of California in Santa Barbara. He holds a BA degree from Harvard University in Visual and Environmental Studies, and he received his Master's of Fine Arts in Studio Art from the University of California, Irvine. Mr. Shang's photography has been published in the New York Times Magazine, Time, Newsweek, and the LA Times. His artwork has been profiled by the New York Times and twice by ABC World News Tonight, most recently in 2010 by Diane Sawyer and Bob Woodward. I don't know about you, but I love photography. And I have very, almost all of my life, believed in the axiom that a picture really is worth a thousand words. Whether it's a couple kissing in Times Square in 1945, most of us remember that photograph. A single protester challenging a tank in Tiananmen Square. A napalmed Vietnamese girl, or even one of our own Ansel Adams landscapes from California. I always believe that a picture is indeed worth a thousand words. Mr. Shang, however, has me thinking and agreeing in his assertion that photographs have the power to move people that sometimes words don't. So if you were able to see his photographic exhibit, Fearless, which is on display of the lobby in the World Theater this evening, I think you would agree. Both examples and both axioms whether it's a photo invoking a thousand words or the singular powerful image speaks to the power of the photographed image. Fearless is a series of photos that Mr. Shang has worked on since 2003 that depict lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered high school and college athletes who are open about their sexuality. Very appropriately, this exhibit was shown at the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver, and in the past four years, has toured more than 40 colleges and high schools. Fearless is an example of his work as a photographer and how his work compels us to see his subjects as individuals whose lives and goals are not defined by their sexuality and who are very much a part of the fabric of our society. Another of Mr. Shang's projects, aptly named Don't Ask, Don't Tell, has received enormous attention during the current national discussion of the policies affecting gay and lesbian members of the armed forces. This past March, the New York Times had an article about this exhibit. The headline was extremely concise and very telling about the conviction and the commitment that Mr. Shang brings to his art. It read simply, he asked, they told. The Times article described Mr. Shang as earnest, earnest and passionate about his work and that he struggles to avoid being heavy handed as an artist. I merge a fight for social equity and equality with photography, but I'm always trying to figure out a way to do it intelligently, he said. We are delighted to have him with us this evening to discuss some of the ways he's been able to accomplish this. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Mr. Jeff Shane.
I just really want to thank President Harrison and um, the st uh, students for coming out tonight to see me uh, here in the audience tonight, and also for the uh, wonderful faculty who I think voted or something to bring me here. They, they were taking suggestions. It was really quite an honor um, when somebody called and asked if I would be one of the presidential speakers this year. And um, it's really a delight as an artist. Um, you, you really just hope that when you make your work, whether it's painting, photography, film, that one day you'll be able to share the work with an audience. And um, I'm really grateful to be here today, so thank you for that. I just want to start quickly with, um, this is the first slide I always show whenever I speak about my work. Um, and actually, when I'm, sh when I'm showing these slides, I'm going to visually, I'm going to describe them in a way, um, what they are, because I believe we're on the radio, um, so that those of you who are listening on the radio can actually see the images. And I'll try to actually say the titles of the images as well, so you can go to my website at uh, www.jeffshang.com to actually see the images if you're actually listening on the radio right now. Um, but this image actually is a, a picture I took with my iPhone. Uh, it's from my childhood bedroom. It's actually a bunch of uh, tennis trophies that I won when I was between the ages of 12 and 16. And um, I grew up as an athlete. Uh, my younger brother actually played tennis for Stanford on a scholarship. And my dad played uh, volleyball for college. And um, ever since I was seven or eight years old, um, I played tennis about two or three hours a day. It was something that we just did um, as a family. Um, the one thing I could never really reconcile, I think, growing up, was this idea of um, my sexuality. And in high school, I was very closeted, actually. Um, and now, uh, when people see that I speak about um, LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender rights, uh, they think I was some really out and proud teenager who was very comfortable about who they were when they were very little. But that's very far from the truth. Um, I actually remember when I was 14 years old, when I was a freshman at high school, a senior on the tennis team, um, I walked onto the varsity team. I was the number two player in high school. And uh, one of the co-captains actually came out to the rest of the uh, student body and, and his teammates. And um, we made fun of him so badly that he actually decided not to play tennis that year as a senior. Um, and this is a story that I actually remembered um, after I began photographing Fearless, the body of work that you see outside in the lobby. Um, but it's one of many stories that, to be honest, I'm not really quite proud of. I think a lot of us um, look back at our lives and wish we could redo them in some way. And a another thing about my high school experience that I wasn't very happy about was when I finally went to college. I mean, I, I did my undergrad at Harvard, um, as we say in the introduction. Um, I decided not to play tennis, and part of it was uh, I was in the process of potentially coming out. And to me, it wasn't something I could ever be, which was an out athlete. I felt that being in sports was um, an environment that was just not safe. And it wasn't a place that uh, I wanted to um, you know, be. I didn't want to be that guy who was, who was gay on a sports team. And so I have this picture of uh, tennis trophies up just to remind myself of sort of my own past and maybe the shortcomings that we all kind of um, you know, make these decisions in life that, that change the entire direction of where it goes. So strangely enough, actually, when I quit playing tennis, um, this was right before college. And the summer before um, I was to go to college, uh, my parents realized that I wasn't um, getting enough exercise and I wasn't doing enough. And I was sort of sitting at home and I was getting fat. And I was, you know, when you're used to playing two or three hours of tennis a day, uh, you, you need something to, to pass away the time. So they bought me a film camera, actually, for uh, graduation. And they uh, were generous enough to offer if I would, uh, t you know, do you want to take a photography course at the local community college? And um, I grew up in Thousand Oaks, uh, down south in California. And um, what I wound up doing was I took a class at Moore Park College. And it was one of these classes that really revolutionized the way you think about your own life. It was the first time I, uh, to be honest, I had a lot of fun. Um, not that tennis wasn't fun, but I think being in a dark room at that time in my life, being able to kind of process my own thoughts and uh, be on my own um, when I was 17, 18 years old, really allowed me to think about the world. And, and photography became this magical outlet for that. Uh, I also began to realize that there was this um, fabulous way in which hitting a tennis ball sounded so much like a camera operating, that you look through a viewfinder and you look for a shot. and um, you kind of snap away and you hear this repetitive sound and, and some shots are better than others. Um, and it was so meditative for me that, that I really fell in love with photography. 
And um, it really became this outlet for who I became. Uh, I, I went to Harvard that year, and I had planned to sort of major in uh, pre-law and history and be a civil rights attorney eventually in life. That was sort of where I saw the direction of my life going. And what wound up happening was I took an ele another elective in photography at Harvard, and, and I just really loved it. You know, it was something that I, I felt passionate about. And not that I didn't feel passionate about changing the world, but I began to wonder maybe there was a way for me to actually bridge the two and to um, be able to use photography. And this was in um, 1998 when I was a freshman in um, college. So this was before you know, the whole documentary craze about uh, art and, and film changing you know, people's minds. Um, but as I began to kind of see the internet and I began to see the way in which media had a bigger and bigger influence on our society, I began to realize that maybe um, being a visual art major wasn't so bad after all. And that's essentially what I did at Harvard. Um, under the encouragement of a lot of really great professors there, um, I, I wound up doing, I, I decided to really pursue photography. And the first um, photo project, the one you see in the hallway outside, um, that I'll first be speaking about tonight, uh, you know, it's stated, it's, it's, it really was, uh, I, I, can't dis, I can't really say why I did it. Um, to be honest, I, I know why, and part of it was because of this really um, sad part about my, my background where I wasn't able to pursue tennis. I, I mean, I loved the sport and I quit it because of this part of myself, my sexuality, that prevented me from um, fully being who I was in this sport. And so I decided um, after graduating from Harvard that I would pursue this project. And a lot of people always ask, well, how did you start the photo series? Um, where did you find these subjects? And I remember actually the first email I sent was to my college roommates. I lived with uh, 12 straight guys at Harvard and, and I was out to them and they were very, very supportive to me. And um, a few of them were also varsity athletes at the school. And um, I, I just kind of emailed them saying, this is my next big project that I want to do after college. Um, do you happen to know anybody from your sports team or, or hear about anybody who could possibly fit this um, category of, uh, for the series I'm working on? And um, one of my roommates, who was a wrestler in college, actually emailed me back and, and said, um, my sister uh, plays rugby at Brown, and I, I suspect she might be a lesbian. Let me ask her, and we'll, we'll sort of, you know, figure this out, and maybe you could photograph her. And I kind of, this was kind of like my roommates in, in college. This is what they were like. And um, he writes back to me and says, you know what? She's actually not a lesbian. Um, but <laughs> turns out uh, one of her teammates um, has a younger brother who is on a sports team. Uh, at, who's on the Brown squash team, and he just came out as a freshman um, on this team. And during this time, I was actually a teaching assistant at Harvard. I'd stayed to help my graduate, uh, my advisor, um, my undergrad advisor, sorry, to, to, with a, one of his classes as a teaching assistant. And um, I would drive down to Brown every week, um, every weekend, um, where I had some free time, and I would photograph this individual who was named Aaron. And um, he was super nice, and he kind of believed in what I was trying to do. Um, he, he sort of saw my passion for really making this project a very big thing. And um, he was kind of just this most confident person, actually. And I remember photographing him every weekend, not really quite sure what the project was going to be. So I photographed him um, you know, with his friends uh, when he went out at night uh, with his clubbing friends. And then I also photographed him with his teammates. Um, none of the pictures came back that were really interesting that I thought was going to be what I wanted as the project. Um, I tried these old yearbook photographs that were kind of black and white. And there was something about this uh, way in which I think I was trying too hard to photograph him without his, um, the, his identity as an athlete present. And I began to really think about this idea that, you know, how do I capture him as an athlete? And one day I just sort of said, what about making him work out and, and play a sport? And then I realized that um, Aaron actually had this really strange habit, which was he'd kind of make a face every time I put a camera um, up to him. He was very um, odd in terms of um, when he was photographed. He, he was slightly awkward. And, and I tried to figure out the, the solution for both of these problems, which was simply, why don't I make him work out really hard and then photograph him in between these workouts? And um, we got to a squash court, and immediately um, I had him run lines. And, um, 
essentially what happened was he looked at the camera in between these different practice sets and I took a series of pictures. And when I got the um, photographs back, this was the first image um, from the series that I really, or from his photo shoots after going to Brown about 10 different times before I started to think this is how I was going to photograph this project. And um, you can see this image and he's staring directly at the camera and behind him he has um, the marks of the squash cord. And I liked a lot how he was staring back at you. And it made me realize that one of those reasons is because um, when you come out, I think a lot of people have this fear that people are always talking about you behind your back or they're looking at you or they're staring. And one of the, the ways you get somebody to stop staring at you is you just simply stare back at them. And there was this really powerful way in which an individual kind of stood in front of you, um, kind of proud about who they were, and just gave you this look back as if there was nothing to fear. And I continued to photograph um, in this way. And Ella turned out to be a sophomore at Harvard at the time who volunteered for the photo project. And in each case, um, here she's rowing on a practice erg, and she's just turning in the middle of the photo shoot every a couple minutes to look at the camera. And Lindsay was somebody else at Brown that I began to photograph. And Dan I actually found um, through a Google search of various news articles. And um, the articles reprinted outside in the lobby. I originally wasn't going to include high school athletes, but after reading his story, and, and in the story basically, he was this really popular um, captain of the cross country and track team who um, had a lot of friends in high school and, there, and he was sharing with me when I finally met him and photographed him how one of the major reasons why he decided to come out was because there was another person in his class who um, was, did not have the same privilege as he did in terms of popularity who had certain mannerisms that uh, made him more of a target for being gay. And Dan was very closeted at the time about his own sexuality and watched his teammates make comments and say things in the locker room and to this other person and harass this other person and bully him. And Dan, every time he saw that happen, realized that this they were talking about him essentially but just didn't know it. Every time they said some homophobic remark or made a comment about this other person's sexuality. So what he decided to do was um, their school had um, an annual diversity day where students were invited to speak out about um, various things about themselves and, and to, to the school. And it was a response the school set up in response to Columbine, actually, because the school felt that it was, um, you know, that, that they needed to do a better job of providing an outlet for um, the, the student community. And Dan, actually, when he approached the principal, he said, you know, I don't think you know this about me, but I'm gay. And um, I've talked to my parents already, and I would like to tell the school this. And the principal at first was incredibly um, not supportive of this decision simply for the fact that he wasn't sure how the student body would react. It was the first time any student had publicly admitted their own sexuality in this way. And he was really afraid that the negative um, repercussions of this uh, would really harm Dan and his um, student life. But Dan persisted. And, and you know, he recounts um, the story to me when I met him. And he said basically after telling um, the student body this about himself. You know, he said, I'm Dan, and you know me as this, and I also happen to be gay. And um, he said to the other students that, you know, I know a lot of you make fun of other people. You know, you never make fun of me, but when you make fun of these other people, you make fun of me as well. That his teammates were just so emotional about this. They, they never thought of it in that way. And for that one day, he had made such a huge difference to his student body. And, you know, I remember meeting him and just seeing this kid who was, you know, five, six years younger than me and, and just really thinking, like, wow, like, I could never do that. And, you know, oftentimes people meet me and they kind of look at my photographs and they say, you know, you've done a really great job capturing these individuals. Um, thank you for all your work. And I, and I really am reminded that it's not me that, that really has done something that special, but rather I'm capturing the lives and stories of these other individuals who truthfully deserve all this recognition. And I sort of just continued this photo project, um, you know, finding people through word of mouth, actually. Um, it was a very kind of viral thing. A friend would hear about the project and tell his friends and or her friends and, and kind of continue, um, you know, I, I'd get more people volunteering, essentially. 
And oftentimes it was just from the trust of these individuals. The idea that I was um, doing something about them. You know, I was trying to be an advocate, um, trying to decrease homophobia in sports. An interesting story about Andrea, um, she sued the University of Florida for discrimination. And, and the reason why in the lobby you see the reprints of the articles, I won't get too much into the lawsuit. Um, you can read um, more of it on the newspaper reprints on her uh, poster outside. Um, it's because in the lawsuit that she settled with the school. Um, she is no longer allowed to talk about what happened. Um, but rather, anything printed before the lawsuit was settled is something that she can actually refer people to. And essentially, um, the, the softball coach at the University of Florida at the time uh, was suspected of being very discriminatory to her as an open lesbian playing softball. And a lot of people actually ask me, um, do you find that you have more women in your project as opposed to men? And um, you know, it's actually been more 55% men and 45% women throughout um, the entire series. And so far, I've photographed over 130 individuals for this project. And it's consistently been more men than women volunteering. And I've begun to really think about, you know, and, and I've also asked like the women who volunteer, like what prevents you from volunteering? Because it seems almost the other way around, that there would be more women. I mean, the stereotype that we have um, of female athletes is, is such where you think there'd be more women. And um, one of them actually said, well, one of the pressures you have as a female athlete is that sometimes you don't want to um, perpetuate that stereotype. And so a lot of the times there's um, homophobia in women's sports um, against lesbians who play sports because they feel like they're damaging the name of, of you know, the female uh, women playing sports. And, and so I think that sometimes, um, you know, interesting things come up in this project for me that, that I would have never thought about. And I'm not going to go through all 130 photographs of the series. That would take forever. And I really actually will spend um, half my time talking about Fearless, but the other half actually talking about my other project on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, mostly because you don't have that series on Don't Ask, Don't Tell here in your lobby. And um, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell series um, is the one I've been working on a little more intensely for the last two years. So as I kind of continued, um, I mean, a lot of the pictures um, were funded just by myself. I was a teaching, I went to grad school at UC Irvine at this time and sort of supported my plane flight travel with um, funds I'd saved from student teaching. Um, I, I got a grant through the Palm Days and Soros uh, Fellowship as, in grad school to help fund the work. And then what started to happen is schools started to ask me to speak about the work. Um, and one of the first schools that invited me to come to their campus was the University of Florida. Ironically, because of that lawsuit that I had talked about earlier from Andrea, um, the, the school decided to put a lot of money into diversity um, fund, f funding for their campus, um, especially around LGBT issues. And um, the University of Florida called me up one day and said, we know you were on campus to photograph Andrea Zimbardi, and would you come to our campus to exhibit the work? Um, we've booked the, the, the gallery here on campus, the student gallery, uh, for the month of April, and um, we'd love for you to come exhibit the work. And I agreed, and um, we made all the arrangements. Uh, Margaret Cho was the keynote speaker, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and, you know, we were all set until, I think, halfway into March, I get this frantic phone call from the president of their LGBT group saying, I'm so sorry about this. We booked the gallery for April, but we didn't realize that was for April of 2007, which was next year. And in fact, the gallery fills up, like many student galleries do, a year in advance. Um, do you want to exhibit the work next year? Or do you want, I mean, wh wh what do you want to do? And I kind of, at the time, at grad school, was thinking a lot about exhibition venues and site. Um, it's this thing in art called um, uh, institutional critique, where Sometimes uh, you think about the, the venues in which you create your art, whether, and, and you kind of challenge the space and interrogate the space as a viable place um, for the meaning of your work. And what I began to realize was that um, this work, which was very activist in nature, I, don't, I didn't know if I wanted it to be in a gallery or a museum. I began to realize that you know, if it was in a gallery or a museum, students might not come to it, the ones that I want to see the work. You know, if you think about it, the football team captain is not going to come by, you know, the gallery to look at a show about gay athletes. I mean, it seems like, you know, one of these things where how do I get the work in front of people 
um, in a way that kind of is, uh, you know, sneaky, I guess. And I remember looking at pictures of the Wrights Union Gallery at the University of Florida and seeing these um, flyers. So the walls you see right now with the photographs have all these flyers. And I said, what if we just turn that into a gallery space? Who goes to that space? What, what is it used for? Who, who walks by it? And um, the LGBT president said, basically, that's the hallway between classes and where everyone eats for most of the campus. So during the month, you'll have about 30,000 students pass by that space. And I sort of said, that's brilliant. That's where I want the exhibition. And to them, they were like, that's the most terrifying idea in the world. What, what do we do if someone defaces? I mean, they literally said, somebody's going to tear down these photographs within the first day. And I said, well, let's do this. How about I print up two of everything, and I'll leave one set behind with you. And if somebody tears something down, just replace it the next day. It'll be some magic trick we do for them. And... Um, they said, okay, well, what's, what is this going to cost? And I sort of said, well, nothing. Just you know, pay for my flight, and, and we're all set to go. Like, I was so excited about doing this because um, it was one of the first exhibitions of the work, and, and I thought this is the best place for me to put it, in a space where everyone could walk by and see it. Um, what's really interesting about um, this exhibit is that nobody actually tore down any of the photographs. Um, they were in a space that was um, accessible 24 hours, with no video surveillance or anything. And I think part of the reason for that is because when you look at these images, uh, you see someone that you know, you see somebody that you like and that you're friends with or that's in your family and that there's this inherent um, part of you who, which just decides I'm not gonna deface this image. So I continued this uh, method of exhibiting the work um, throughout Basically, whatever school volunteered to be part of it, um, I, I just said, I'm going to um, put an exhibition for you. And while I was at these different schools, uh, various athletes started to volunteer. And, and notice here, I'm, this, these are photo, photographs I took all at Oberlin College when I was there doing the exhibition for their school. And I decided that I wasn't going to pick and choose which athletes I was going to photograph. I thought that if you were brave enough to volunteer to be in this series and then to have your image um, shown at campuses around the world, essentially, that, that I wouldn't say, you know what, I've already gotten a softball player from this school or a soccer player from this school. And I would never say to anybody, like, you're too, you know, your body doesn't look like an athlete or anything. You know, to me, it was about pick, uh, uh, letting anybody who wanted to be in the project be in the project. It's about inclusion. And I was lucky enough, um, you know, in terms of race, because I teach in Asian American studies, um, you know, I will say that one of the things about the series is that, you know, most of the athletes that do volunteer are, are white identified. And um, however, you know, the student athletes of color that I've been able to photograph at one point in the project were about 20 percent. Um, it's fallen a little bit since then, only because um, I've been photographing a lot in Canada, which is very white, and then um, some of the schools that I photograph at um, now, because what happens is there's not really a methodology to the way I work. It's essentially whenever a school invites me to speak, I bring all my photo gear, and if someone volunteers, I'll photograph them. And unfortunately, a lot of the schools that have the budgets now to bring me to speak are ones in, you know, in New England and usually kind of private schools um, that have a certain student body. Um, and, you know, I'm still photographing the series, and, you know, I have been looking for grants um, to, to kind of expand the project more in the South, for instance, an area that I haven't been able to photograph as much in. Um, this is an installation shot from the University of Pennsylvania. And I just wanted to quickly show um, kind of a quick video of um, the exhibition I did there. And this exhibition actually was spearheaded by one of the students there who decided that they wanted the exhibition at their gym. And this is the undergraduate and graduate gym that everybody uses. And um, I was doing, I, th I just thought that this was the coolest place, right? Because you, you're, you're an athlete, you go work out. You, um, that's the entrance. And um, it's where all the faculty go. Um, and it's the only place at the University of Pennsylvania that, that people work out in. And I have um, the project description and the various news articles there so people can see the images, kind of get sucked into it and then read about what the work is about. I was doing this video kind of slyly on my small little point and shoot camera, and these two people came by. And 
oh, what's this? And they kind of casually like go up to the images, you know. And you know, this is exactly what I wanted. Um, and I began to repeat this over and over again. And um, you know, it it was wonderful, you know, to to be able to use photography in this way. And you know, you always say that photography says you know speaks a thousand words. And, and in an instant, I've kind of gotten somebody to look at something in a different way than what they're used to. Um, you know, I'm going to show, let's see here, in 2007, I started, I mean, basically from, in 2007 is really when the project started taking off. I had done about 15 exhibitions around the country at that time. And, um, you know, more and more people started to hear about the project and started to Facebook it or email it or, or you know, kind of talk to their friends about it. In 2008, I did an exhibition at ESPN headquarters in Connecticut. And uh, that was the first interview I did with ABC World News Tonight about the series. And um, right around this time, I just started to get a lot of media attention. And it was um, interesting the way the internet works. Because one day I would kind of get to my computer and um, check my email. And I would get this email from a closet service member overseas. And, and um, I got around 10 emails from people serving in either Kuwait, Iraq, or Afghanistan, all within a six-week period. Um, at the end of 2008, and they all said something to the effect of, I used to be a closeted athlete. I played baseball or softball or, or football. And um, I wasn't able to come out because of my own self then, and now that I'm in the military, I'm not able to come out because of the don't ask, don't tell policy. And I saw your project on the athletes online, and I see these individuals who are so proud about who they are. Um, and it breaks my heart because I just can't be that right now because of this policy. And then they would ask, and they would always kind of allude to, would you ever do a photo project about Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or photographing service members who um, are either out or closeted? And I wrote back each time and said, uh, if I was to do a project on closeted service members, would you be willing to be in it? And um, all of them said yes. They just basically said, when I get back from Kuwait or when I get back from Afghanistan, I'll just let you know. And if you could come to Arkansas or South Carolina, <laughs> then sure, I'd love to be in a photo shoot for you. And, I, and to be honest, I, I was really hesitant to, to do this series. Um, a lot of it was, how do I take a photograph of somebody where I don't show their faces? I mean, if you see these images that I'm showing you now of Fearless, of these very um, proud individuals where you clearly see who they are, how do I adapt my work so that I would essentially do the opposite, where I closet somebody? And I looked at a lot of um, photo history and art history, images at where you couldn't see somebody's face or you couldn't see somebody's identity. Um, I also looked at a lot of pictures in bedrooms because I wanted to do the photographs in somebody's bedroom because of the way in which I could comment about the intersections of public and private. That if you think about you know, government and the policing of private space, that the bedroom essentially is the one space, your home where you live, um, is a space of privacy that, that is very fundamental as an American ideal. Um, so I looked at a lot of these different photographs, and in early 2009, after President Obama was elected, and I began to kind of see that there wasn't any action on the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy by the president, I, I fully committed to working on it. And the first image that I took from the photo series, I'm going to switch to a different uh, thing here. This is the um, first photograph that I took. Um, for, for, the, for the series, um, and he was actually an athlete in high school and college, um, and it was one of those initial contacts. Um, the original photograph, actually, is of his whole face, and I, I know this guy very well, and I realized that he had wanted me in many ways to sort of create this portrait of him um, where you could see his face, and, and when I got the images back to my studio, I realized something was wrong. I, I didn't like this idea that I would be the reason for somebody's removal from the military and their job. Um, the location, the title that you see, Alexander Tokyo, is actually not his real name, nor is it the location at which the photograph was taken. Um, the titles that you'll see are all places and names that are significant to the individual. I show them the image that I want to use for the series, and they give me a name and location that's meaningful to them. And as, I, I, as I've done this body of work, I've discovered that the names and locations are incredibly moving. I don't know all of them, but sometimes they'll voluntarily tell me. So, you know, I know in a few of them it's 
their grandfather who um, was some famous general or um, it's somebody who they first fell in love with or it's um, a, a relative who died in a war, for instance. And the locations are oftentimes very significant as well. Um, but in this first image, I, I just basically cropped the image so you couldn't see his full face. And um, it's one of the only images in which I've actually cropped them. And one of the reasons is because this was the first photograph that I took for the series in which I was trying to figure it out. I was really trying to get a sense of how I was going to photograph this series. Um, this image, Kenneth Kuwait, another photograph in where um, he contacted me. And I remember actually him sending me photographs of him in his um, baseball uniform from high school. Um, and I, got, I remember getting this email and just thinking, like, this is the most moving thing that you would trust me with all this information about you, your name, and, and these pictures of yourself. And I actually realized that trust became such a huge factor for this project in the way that um, these people would just email me, and, and we'd correspond online, and then I'd show up in the middle of the country photographing them, hoping that they were who they were. Um, a lot of the photo shoots are in parts of the country that I've never been to, the Deep South, for instance. You know, and, and there were times at which, you know, when I really began to think about it, right, that I'm photographing these people in the military who might have weapons, who might be, um, you know, I don't know who they really are. And, and just to kind of show up at their doorstep and be willing to photograph them um, without any sort of background check because they trusted me that I wasn't going to turn them in or get or know too much information, I think lent itself um, to really have this intimacy in the photographs. Um, this photograph, Jess Bend, Oregon, um, is one of those images where you know I've, I, I've gotten to know this service member very well since um, he was one of the people profiled in uh, the second ABC World News interview they did with me on this body of work. And um, you know, in this series, I simply said, hold your hand up, like, you know, you're it's the paparazzi, and they're trying to take your picture. And, and we tried different things with that. And I think one of the reasons why this image resonates so much with the public is because you look at it, and you really see somebody that you think you know. It might look like a relative of yours or a friend. I mean, it's so sort of anonymous, um, but so every, every day in many ways. An interesting thing about this picture is that um, if you look on the fireplace mantle, and I'm looking at Mike Boston, Massachusetts, um, you'll see a Christmas card. And I realized actually um, later on when I was looking at this picture with some of his friends who I actually wound up photographing, a lot of the service members have different um, groups that they uh, you know, also find out are also gay or lesbian, and they, they hang out together, and they keep this kind of code of secrecy among themselves. Um, and here, he introduced me to his friend, to his friend, and vice versa. And um, I think four of the Christmas cards are from other service members who are, who are in this photo series. And I didn't really realize it until later on after I photographed all of them. They were looking at this picture, and, and one of them says, that's the Christmas card I sent so-and-so. And it's quite um, nice to know that. And, you know, people ask, like, you know, the hotel rooms thing was basically because a lot of these people are at military bases that I'm not allowed access to. So um, I would just do the photo shoot in the hotel room that I was um, staying at. And in this case, this was like a Holiday Inn Express or something that I price-lined. I got really good at price-lining $40 hotels around the country. And, um, you know, they just happen to give me a room with these, like, ships on the wall. I mean, it's not even stage or anything. It just was, oh, let's just have you look at, you know, it was like, oh, you're in the Navy. Great. <laughs> and the beginning of this project was all about trying to take a picture of somebody without their faces showing, about hiding their identity. Um, these photographs are all part of um, volume one. Um, I self-published um, this book in uh, earlier in January this year, and it's, I called it Volume 1 because it was the first volume of a planned series of photo, um, photo books I was going to do on the issue. And, um, and afterwards, I'll have some copies in the back for sale to sign. But um, Volume 1 is very interesting because um, it was about making a photo book that was accessible. This was the um, book that the New York Times wrote about, actually, because it was um, 8 by 8 soft cover, and I purposely meant for it to be very lightweight so I could s ship it mail it to various senators, um, people who were um, involved with the Donuts Hotel issue. It was more like um, using photography in a way to, to be an activist 
Um, and it was really easy to kind of mail off and pass around to different friends. And so all the photographs you're looking at now are from 2009. And um, this image that you're seeing, Lynn Celine, is the first um, of a couple that I photographed. And um, what really happened um, in photographing the first part of this project for me was I began to become friends with these people who were around my age or younger. I'm 30 years old. Um, and many of these service members were in their, I think, early, mid, or late 20s. Um, some, like in this image of Lynn Celine, the service members actually um, in her 40s, um, you know, so there is a variety of age. But for the most part, with, especially with the younger service members, I, I began to sort of stop and think, wow, you're, you're my age and you've been at war? Like it was this really confusing thing for me because of the way we never talk about war. You know, this idea that we've been at war for nine years, um, you know, for, for much of it in two different countries and two different wars. And, and, I had no idea about this in many ways. I mean, I knew about it. You know, I read the news, but, but really our cognizance of it um, wasn't there, our, our level of understanding of it. Um, this image I shot almost about a year ago, exactly a year ago. It was in December of 2009. And um, we did this photo shoot um, kind of quickly, actually. I, I was trying to do a bunch of photo shoots all at the same time, and I kind of rushed this one, but I, I saw his frame in the silhouette and thought it was really beautiful. The, the image is called Matt Lubbock, Texas. And um, it was the last photo shoot that I was going to do. Um, so I had some time to kind of hang out with this service member. And I said, do you want to have lunch? And he said, sure, great. You know, let's go have lunch. So we went to an Olive Garden in the middle of Texas. I love all you can eat soup and salad. So I figure I like Olive Garden. And, and we sat there. And I, you know, I'm kind of in my own world at this point. I sort of had done the photo shoot. I um, did my job, essentially. and, and we sat down, and I, I wanted to know a little bit more about this person, so I asked, um, so what do you do in the military? Like, I actually try not to ask too many questions until I get to know them a bit better, either during or after the photo shoot. And um, he said, well, I'm a medic. And I said, oh, so what do you do as a medic? He's like, well, my job is to s save people, and, and you know, when we're in Iraq or Afghanistan, I, I ride along the with the tanks. Um, so that if we were to get hit, I would be the first person on site to be able to um, administer aid. And I looked at him and said, how many times have you been overseas? He's like, oh, I just finished my third tour in Iraq. And, um, you know, I sort of asked a dumb question. And I, I mean, I don't know if any questions are really that dumb, but I said, um, have you ever seen anyone die? And he kind of looks at me and goes, the reason why I'm here is because um, in my last tour, our tank was hit by an IED, and um, my two best friends were killed next to me. And I wasn't there to save them because I was unconscious. And I looked at him, and there was this scar that ran from the length of his ear underneath his jaw. And I suddenly just sort of realized, like, the severity of, of this, you know, what I was photographing. And the words don't ask, don't tell suddenly really changed meaning for me at that time. That, the donuts don't tell part applied to the fact that these people had gone to war. And had I never asked this question, you know, that dumb question that I thought, have you ever seen anyone die? He would have never told me the answer. Um, and that just moved me beyond belief. And it, it was really that moment at which I think I really changed as a person. I was 29 at the time. And my friends really said, you know, I turned 30 in September, and my friends said, you've changed so much in the last year. And I said, well, Imagine traveling around the country, meeting people who have to hide who they are, who have to kind of closet themselves a really important part of who they are, and then go out and fight and die for their country. And imagine becoming friends with them and having to photograph them and meet them one by one and, and carry that piece of them with you as you, as you go on with your, your life. So volume two um, that I sort of set out to do um, well, I still had this element of trying to hide um, their identities. There was also really much this, um, you know, there was this part of the project that was really quite um, hard for me. You know, these photographs were taken in early 2010. There was a lot more kind of loneliness and despair, I think, in the images. Um, you know, with some, I sort of had them do various gestures. And as I continued the photo project, um, 
I began to really think about the ways in which war could be represented in these images, how it wasn't necessarily their um, sexual identities that mattered to me as much as the fact that their identity as a service member was more important. You know, in this case, you know, I, this is um, a former service member, and that's her, a picture of her partner who was in Iraq when we did the photo shoot. And in many ways, it sort of um, comments on this idea of sort of the lost at sea or lost at war images that you see. And in each case, you can't see who's in the photograph. You know, I would sort of try to find a lot of symbolism in a lot of the images. You know, the wind coming through a curtain. Um, yeah, there's something really beautiful about this image, the way you're sort of looking out into the world. Um, he's in the Coast Guard, incidentally. And this photograph is so interesting for me because um, this person's grandfather played for the Phillies in ba baseball, the baseball team. And so we had his baseball glove out there because he was a, a really big athlete. The service member was a big athlete in baseball too. Um, and I really began to see the connections between my earlier work and the work I was doing on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And here it was, you know, I liked the way in which the light was hitting his fingertips as if he was praying. Oops, sorry. Oh, oops. Um, this is a service member who was actually in the process of being discharged. And sort of I had this beautiful photograph set up where the boots representing her former life and the new life that she was sort of forced now to be in. You know, I started to try to figure out more creative ways to represent these individuals. I mean, there's only so much you can do with somebody's hand covering their face, but in this case it was sort of like dig your head into the pillow. Um, here, um, this is actually a female Marine. A lot of people ask me, why is it that you don't have a lot of women in the project? And I actually say about 15 to 20% of the service members you're seeing are women. Um, it's just that you can't really tell their gender sometimes based on the way the image is. And only through maybe the um, title of the image can you see, see um, figure out who, what gender they are. And here, um, you know, she actually said to me, please don't expose my identity to everybody because I pay my parents' mortgage. Um, I grew up in a small town in Texas, and this was the only way financially for me to have a better life. You know, and just a lot of people always ask me, why is it that these people decide to be in the military when they know that they're discriminated against? And I say, well, you know, for many of these people, it's either a financial decision, or for some, they just are really proud to serve their country. They come from a long line of military families, and this is what they've always known. Anderson Cooper happened to be on TV. So, I mean, serious, actually. We were watching CNN, and he just came on the TV, and I took a bunch of pictures. Um, you know, here it's kind of like looking out and looking, you know, seeing who's looking in. Sorry if I go through these photographs kind of quickly. You can, all see, you can always see them on my website, and I'll show you a clip later on of the recent exhibition I did of the work. Um, in Los Angeles. You know, and as I mentioned before, in gestures became really important. Like here I sort of said, fire a gun, like, you know, as if you were at war. And, and this is why I don't necessarily think I'm a photojournalist sometimes. I, I kind of collaborate with these individuals, creating images that represent who they are. Um, and they get really into this, you know, cover your partner's face as if a bomb is about to hit you. You know, throw your water grenade as if it was a, you know, water, water bottle as if it was a grenade. This is actually of a female service member who was, um, the portrait is a portrait of her partner. And while she was in Iraq, the service member, her partner had um, a lump diagnosed in her breast. And they weren't actually able to communicate fully during this time while she had the um, lump removed. Um, and it's just those stories that really break my heart. Um, this idea of kind of your family and who you love and not being able to be open about it. Here it's, um, his kids, you know, he has a family with three kids, and if he was ever to be outed, um, the kids would lose their health insurance, for instance, and their livelihood. Um, this is one of the more iconic images from the series, and um, 
I, you know, it was near the end, uh, the most recent shoots I've been doing where I asked the service member to jump on a bed. And she kind of saw the images on my digital camera and, and we realized this um, way in which the image evoked uh, someone hanging. And during the time in which I was taking this image, um, a lot of the reports of military suicides uh, were being brought up in the news. You know, and I, I decided that it was really important for me to show an image that represented this. I thought if I was talking about the identities of service members, that this was um, something I wanted to try and, and capture. But I was really afraid of the service member's reaction to the image when I showed her the final picture. Because if she didn't like the image, if she f at all felt that this was disrespectful for her or her uniform, um, she would, uh, she would, and she asked me not to use it. I, I wouldn't use the image. So I remember emailing her this picture and saying, you know, I really like this image, but if you have a problem with it, please tell me because I can find another photograph that's just as good without this um, kind of uh, symbolism. And she actually said to me, a few weeks after this photo shoot, uh, my best friend killed herself in a hotel room. And I really want to dedicate this picture to her because I think it's so powerful and will remind me of, of that, of her. And so I'm kind of going to end, um, wrap up this presentation with uh, by reading an email actually from uh, that I've reprinted in volume one of the book. And what happened was um, one of these service members, I'm sorry, one of these individuals in this photograph, uh, the partner of the service member, um, who I eventually, I met them after they sent me this email, but they had been corresponding with me for a few months. And they said, um, if I send you an email, will you please publish it somehow? And I said, sure. You know, I, I was trying to figure out at the time, like, how to make a book that was powerful enough to really be representative of the issue. And um, he sent me this email on January 1st of this year. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly enough, he addressed it to the president. And I'm just going to read it verbatim um, to you. Dear Mr. President, because the person I love can be discharged for loving me back, even though he is honorably serving his country right now in Iraq, I have to send this letter anonymously. It pains me to have to do so. I became an early supporter because more than anything, I needed to believe in you. I needed to believe that reason, hope, and integrity could win the day. My memories of being at the convention in Denver and then the inauguration will provide me with enough hope for a lifetime, and for that, I am forever grateful. But I've been around politics enough to understand the great difficulty you face on the issue of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Within the gay community, there is contentious debate about whether the argument for repeal should be based on civil rights or national security. Considering the vehemence of the opposition, I do not envy any politician these choices. But I am compelled to remind you that there are tens of thousands like me who continue to suffer under the current policy. My partner is currently serving in Iraq and is in a situation where he is under fire on a daily basis. He's a good soldier and our country needs him to continue doing the excellent job that he's been recognized for. The day he deployed, I dropped him off far from his base's main gate, and he walked alone in the dark and the rain to report for duty, where the rest of his buddies were surrounded by spouses and children at mobilization ceremonies. He stood by himself. The phone trees don't have my name on them, and base support services don't apply, even though we've been together for 16 years and are raising a beautiful child together. Our communication is self-censored, and we are cruelly unable to nurture each other at the exact moment we both need it the most. If something were to happen to him, no one from his unit will call me. If, like so many good soldiers before him, he gives that last full measure of devotion, no one will come knock on my door. No one will present me with a flag. It is and would be as if the most important thing in his life, his family, never existed. I'm not sure if I can adequately convey the mixture of fear, pride, heartache, and hope I feel all jumbled together on a daily basis. But I ask you to consider relieving the burden of fear and dishonor from our brave men and women who risk being punished simply for whom they love. So I've read that email um, countless times already, and each time I read it, it breaks my heart. But it's something that I do because um, you know, it's as somebody who can be out and somebody who um, is able to speak and, and is able to kind of talk to the public in the way that I'm able to do, uh, I feel it's my job to, 
to do to basically be their advocate. Um, so I thank you a lot for your attention right now, and I, I'm going to kind of move this on to question and answer. Um, so thank you very much. Just give us a, a couple of seconds to set up for um, a Q and A, Jeff. If you could come and sit stage right, and uh, there's more cards. If you didn't get a card, the ushers have additional cards, and you could just pass them down to the ushers, house left and right. If you would like to ask a question, and you could do that during the question and answer period. We're getting ready here, and putting out our water. Um, thank you very much, Jeff. It was a beautiful speech. Loved it. Um, so uh, we have a guest host who is a professor from Humanities and Communications. He teaches law, U.S. history, and politics. A great combination. So he will be hosting our question and answer period this evening. Uh, please welcome Professor David Reichert. David. Are we comfortable? Very. Is my mic working? Is this working? Great. So, uh, Jeff, thanks. That was terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to open up, I think, just with a few questions while we're collecting some from the audience, and then mm -hmm. we can move on to uh, what our folks here are thinking about. But one of the first things I've been noticing in your work, and perhaps this is something that uh, is typical in the kind of stuff you're trying to work on here, but the, the use of a series of photos mm -hmm. really strikes me because when you look at all of these images together, as we saw here on the slideshow, you really get a, a sense of something about uh, not just the individuals, but the collective, mm -hmm. the collective issues that you're trying to address. Yeah. Is that something that you deliberately have set out to do in your work, is to work in series? Is that something that's... Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the public is perhaps used to iconic images, like the one photograph we remember, or many of the images that uh, were described in my introduction uh, by President Harrison. But, um, you know, as, a, as an artist who uh, very much went to school for it, that's something that you learn, I guess, as, as in early on, um, to, to find um, a body of work to really spend your time doing. It seems very standard, I think, in, in photography especially. Is there something uh, in terms of the political issues you're trying to capture that a series really adds to in terms of the debate? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it just lends itself um, to have a lot more power in some ways to see all these individuals. I mean, one of the great things about both photo series is uh, the depth and the, the number of the images that you're able to um, kind of witness. Yeah, the, I think what's really powerful to me as a historian, looking at your images and having worked on LGBT research myself in terms of uh, collecting stories, is that it's a way to collect stories visually in some way because you're capturing a moment in their lives, but you're also listening and talking to them mm -hmm. as well. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about that the story part of your work in terms of talking to the folks you're photographing? <coughs> On the story part, actually, for me is, uh, you know, I don't, I don't record the interviews I do with them. It's a lot of um, kind of just kind of getting to know them better so I can share with the public uh, more about who they are. Um, I rely a lot on the image. I do believe that, that what I really want to try to capture is, is that person's essence in many ways. I mean, people always ask about the pictures from Fearless, like why... Uh, what, what is it you look for in the 100 to 300 photographs you take of these individuals? And, and I just say it's this moment in which you feel like you know the person, in which they have this look about them that you can identify with. It's sort of how I, I pick the picture that is used. We spoke earlier about uh, that you took a number of, a lot of photos of particular subjects. You've chosen one mm -hmm. for the series, but can you tell us a little bit about how, how you make that selection in terms of the number of photos you take? Yeah, I mean, a photo shoot for Fearless will run. Uh, Fearless is shot on film, actually medium format film, and um, Don't Ask, Don't Tell is shot digitally. And the major reason um, is because Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I, I, I do try very hard to show the images to the service members while I'm photographing them so they can um, get more comfortable. I mean, there's this element of trust that builds during the photo shoot. And um, when I 
finish the photo shoot. It can take months. I mean, to be honest, there's photo shoots I've done for Fearless that I shot in March that I haven't looked at yet because I'm just really busy. Um, but it takes a while for me to kind of find one from the entire um, collection of images I've taken to, to be the one I want to live with for the rest of my life. That's kind of hard. What happens to the ones you don't use? They go into my archive, my studio, and I, I save them. I'm very obsessive about saving images. I've got everything backed up like three or four times. I'm terrified of like floods and fires, and, and I have them like, I've got things hidden away at my parents' house in case, you know, my place burns down or something. At least you have a copy, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, let's go to one of the questions from our, sure. from our audience. Mm -hmm. uh, someone is, would like to know, have you considered photographing older out athletes? Um, you know, that question's come up. Uh, what was really interesting for me in Fearless was uh, this idea that they were all on high school and college sports teams. And I know that when you start getting, uh, the older can be many different things. One is maybe the person is um, on a recreational team um, or an LGBT team. Um, and, I, and I think because of my own past connection with high school and college sports, um, and the way in which that shaped who I am and, and part of why I did the work, I decided to keep it um, at the high school or college level. And in no way do I, I mean, I write about this in, I think, my other statement, but I, I, I don't try to say that this is how all bodies should look like, because I do know in the gay community there's this emphasis on uh, young bodies, and, and that's nothing. You know, when I started the project, I was 22, so those kinds of things were not really in uh, my, my way of thinking at the time. So. In terms of the, the age question, I, I know you have high school and college mm -hmm. uh, athletes. Are, are there any concerns about photographing folks who are under 18, for example? Yeah. Does that come up in, in your work? I have, um, I get uh, permission slips from those who are under 18. Um, I always make sure that the parents are fully aware of the photo shoot. I've, this really touching story, um, there's this photograph out there of these twins who are uh, fraternal twins. And they both happen to also be gay, and they also both played sports. And so they contacted me, and I was photographing one of them at their school when uh, this, this was in Connecticut, and this very put together blonde woman is making a beeline towards me in the middle of a photo shoot, and I suddenly stopped and realized that this was so and so's mother. And I was kind of like, I thought you got your parents' permission. <laughs> like, you know, I've got all this documentation, like, what's going on? And, um, this woman comes up to me and just says, Mr. Shang, I, I, I know Chris didn't want me to be here. He's totally embarrassed, I'm sure. But I wanted to thank you for making um, the world a better place for my sons. And, and I was blown away by that because I was expecting the worst. I was expecting for this parent to say, you know, where are these photos going to be? I have to see them. I have to prove them. And really, it was just this incredible thank you. And I've gotten a lot of that actually from the parents of the athletes that I photographed. Have you ever worked in the... The athlete project. Have you ever worked with gay straight alliances in terms of on, on high school campuses? Has that oh. been part of that? <laughs> I happen to be going to New York on Thursday for a meeting with Glisten. So um, yeah, I have. I've been working a lot. You know, I mean, not to say anything bad about the LGBT groups or the organizations that work for them, but a lot of Fearless was done really uh, independently. And, and part of it is because these large organizations have a lot of uh, red tape sometimes. They have a lot of, they don't have a lot of funding themselves, so they couldn't really fund me. I mean, I was just this extra person out there. And, um, you know, for, it was just really important um, for me to do the work without having somebody watching over me the whole time. And um, now they're really supportive, which I'm thankful for. But in the beginning, I was a little bit frustrated that they couldn't provide more support. But I, I understand why now they couldn't. So. Something in terms of that series also struck me uh, as really interesting. And we were talking about it a little bit earlier, and I think it might be worth discussing a bit. Mm -hmm. the, the way that you, you lit those photos, in terms of the, the light being very direct on the athletes yep. and the background being a little bit sort of behind the scenes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the composition, how you decided to shoot those photos that way? Or? Yeah, the photographs were... I use the same equipment for both shoots, just kind of differently, so that they emphasize different um, things I want to say about the images. But I thought um, the lighting that I use for Fearless is uh, very much about kind of trying to capture them on, on a stage in many ways. I mean, it's very theater lighting, but on a field. Um, it's very classical portraiture lighting, but you've got an athlete instead of, you know, Giselle. <laughs> 
So, you know, in many ways, I was just very interested in creating a portrait where the person that I was photographing was the center of the attention. So we have a couple other sure. questions. Sure. I love questions, actually. So someone in our audience would like to know, you mentioned the institutional critique earlier in speech, in, in your speech. Are you making efforts to exhibit your Don't Ask, Don't Tell series in military venues? The Pentagon's come up, but there's a lot of red tape about that. Um, actually, what's interesting, I've given this a lot of thought because I've gotten requests from colleges and um, various different venues to exhibit the Don't Ask, Don't Tell series. And so far, it's only been exhibited in Los Angeles at my art representations gallery and in Washington, D.C. for the Human Rights Campaign for Photo Week. And um, we've been very limited are, we've been limiting the work at venues, uh, mostly because where I see that work is I want it placed in history very strongly in both art history and um, something we look back as in society as a marker at a time in which our government actively discriminated against a group of people in 2010. And um, in order for me to kind of get the work recognized in such a way, um, you know, you have to limit the, the venues in which it's exhibited. It's part of the art world, and it's something that, as I've gotten older, I've learned more about. Where with Fearless, having the work exhibited at all these student centers was very much that project. And um, you know, I hate turning down shows, and it and it it's hard when uh, you know a, a high school is like, we want to show your Donuts Don't Tell series, but the problem is in the art world sometimes if you show your one project in a high school the Museum of Modern Art's not gonna take you seriously. You know, you're not gonna get that Whitney retrospective in 10 years. And, and it's just these, it's, it's silly to be honest at times, but um, like with every profession, you have to take the rules, quote unquote, that the profession set out into consideration. To me that, it's interesting because it strikes me as the conflict between your role as an activist and an advocate and an artist yeah. and a professional Mm -hmm. On the other hand, and that's a tension a lot of folks who are activists have to navigate a little bit, especially in the arts. Yeah. I mean, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, how my business card has changed from like activist to artist in the last two years. Yeah, it's it's been a very conscious, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm not going to uh, pretend to not be conscious of this, but yeah, we've positioned myself and my work as an artist, you know, when somebody asks what you what I what my profession is, I just say I'm an artist. Um, I am an activist, um, but but the art world is scared of activist work. I mean, if you look at the art world, um, especially work done by younger artists, um, not much of it deals with politics. Not much of it deals with gender or race or sexuality. That seems to be something very 1980s. You know, it's not something artists do today, and and it's something I've struggled with. Like. You know, I've, I've gotten a lot of national attention. I've gotten a lot of great publicity for my two photo projects already. But to be honest, for seven years, there was nothing. It was like tumbleweed in you know, my, my CV. I mean, it was just, you know, I've been doing all this work and there was no recognition. And I think at a certain level, once people started to recognize me, that this is perhaps also art, that you could say something about sexuality, um, it's important to recognize that, that other people paid attention to it. Is this the kind of career you anticipated when you went to Harvard art school? Harvard, you mean, which yeah. isn't an art school <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, did you anticipate this kind of art career, that your oh, no. work is taking this direction? In an, no. Uh, um, you know, I, mean, I, I, I resisted majoring in art at Harvard. They don't even call it art there. They call it visual and environmental studies, because this way my diploma says something that might be something a little more you know, prestigious, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, people always ask, like, uh, during dinner tonight, someone, I think the president was like, oh, your parents must have been so happy when you went to Harvard. And I was like, and then I majored in art. <laughs> like, you know, like, that was a shocker for them. Um, it, you know, it's, it's uh, no, it's not the career. I, I, I resisted this for a long time. I'm going to be fully honest about it. I mean, there, I took the LSATs. I mean, I really did, like, really prepared myself for a career in something not in art and uh, but it but this drives me I mean I, I love doing what I do and kind of what I said at the end of my talk is is people don't have a voice sometimes and, and I'm able to 
give them a voice, and, and that amazes me. I used to be the, the shyest person ever, too. I used to, I mean, I would be like shaking right now if I was in front of you, but somehow in the last decade, I've, I've found a voice. I've been able to create images that speak upon things in a way that nobody's seen before. And um, it's a gift that I can't take for granted. So, and I, I always tell my students, because I teach now, that, that sometimes when you really resist something a lot, try to resist it, and it just keeps falling into your lap, take it as a sign and just go with it. You know? Well, sort of the challenge, the, 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 this work is very challenging in a lot of ways. I mean, in the first, the Fearless series, stuff like that had not been done. And even in the community, in the LGBT mm -hmm. community, the, the issue of ath athletics and the role of athletics in the community has a long contested sort of history, mm -hmm. and a rich one too. I mean, I'm thinking of the 1970s, softball, the gay games, all those mm -hmm. sorts of things. So, but it's been sort of a separate part. Um, and what you're trying to, I think, uncover is you know, what happened, what about, how did those folks become athletes that would then maybe go in the gay community into one of those venues? Where did they come from? What was it like, what's it like for that generation coming out in high well, school? It's a great, I, I mean, I'm, I always say whenever young people, or especially young people in the LGBT community, look at their history or their future, um, 10 years is a lot of time. And if you just trace back, and, and you know um, LGBT history more, because you're a historian in it, but today is, what, 2010? If you go to 2000, where um, you know Ellen wasn't even out at that time. I mean, she was out, but she wasn't even, I mean, she was kind of like shoved back in the closet and fired from Disney and, and ABC, and now she's Oprah. You go back, you know, you go back 10 more years, right? You go back 10 more years to 1990, it's sort of the right after the height of the AIDS crisis, and mentioning the word gay was such a horrible thing, you know, which people would shudder at that. You go to 1980, you know, right before Ronald Reagan and, you know, like people, I mean, anything in 1970, and, and, and we make such huge, huge leaps and bounds every 10 years. And you can only think in 2020 what could be there. You know, and that's really what gives me a lot of hope. You know, this idea that, yes, we don't allow gays to serve openly. There is no federal protection for marriage. There are, you know, this and that. But at the same time, I think, you know, this really was better than 10 years ago. And um, that's something that really keeps me doing the work I do. What's interesting, I think, when you look at the series together is you can see what's better. You're photographing out athletes mm -hmm. in college and exactly. high school 10, 15 years yeah. ago. That would never have been possible. Yeah. But we're still struggling with the military piece. So. And, that, and that was something that I felt was um, in many ways a gift to me in terms of my timing. You know, my age, my, I was born in 1980, that it just happened to be that when I was becoming a photographer and given access to um, photograph um, these younger LGBT athletes that I was their age, and it worked out perfectly, and that somehow or another that project just segued into the military project. And people have asked, like, did you time for Don't Ask, Don't Tell to be now? And I said, no, it just it happened to be that right at the height of my project's success was also during the exact time when the Congress was debating it every week, it seems like, um, about the policy. You know, today, like another thing in the news. You know, so that was just timing, and it does mark, um, you know, in, in terms of art, in terms of looking back at my career, I do hope that people look at, say, the portraits of these LGBT athletes from the 2000s and see that kind of change, and they maybe look at the portraits from the Donuts Don't Tell series and see, you know, this discrimination as well. This might be an odd analogy, but one thing I'm thinking of, I guess this is my history training coming through, that in the 1930s, when photographers are documenting the Great Depression, some of the most memorable images of that period are those portraits mm -hmm. of sharecroppers or the Okies moving from to, into California, and those really gripping photographs of, that are just folks living their daily experience. Yeah. And I'm wondering, have you thought about what your work will look like 20, 30 years? I mean, what, what, how will people look back on these portraits? Yeah, I've given this a lot of thought. I mean, I'm, I don't shy away at all from photographing the LGBT community. I think at some, a former generation, it was sort of almost a, a death sentence for your art career in many ways to photograph so specifically identity politics in one area. Um, it's important for me to document my community. Why wouldn't I? 
And um, that's, that's something I hope people can see. And, and, you know, I, I, it, it's weird for me to think about, like, in 20 years, what my photographs will look like. I actually hope I have, like, six or seven other bodies of work, you know, afterwards to kind of back up the work I've already done by then. We'll see what that looks like. So what, what's next in terms of your work? What are you thinking of doing Oh, next? I've got some projects lined up. Um, yeah, I don't, can you talk about No, that? not really. I, I feel bad saying this, but I haven't started them yet. I mean, I've started them in terms of my idea and concept. And, and Fearless was a year and a, and a half in gestation, actually, before I started. And same with Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And, and I have these other projects that, that I'm kind of like feeling out right now. And, and that will probably be very, very powerful when I get them done. But, but in the meantime, I'm, I'm still photographing, finishing up Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I'm still finishing up Fearless. So I don't want to jump the gun too much. Well, I can tell you that someone in the audience has a good idea. OK. Have you gotten any interest from pro athletes, baseball, football, et cetera, in your project? I'm friends uh, with a lot of them, actually. Um, I'm like almost best friends with John Amici, the basketball player who came out. I've met Mark Tewksbury. I've met Billy Bean. I've met um, a lot of the sort of pro athletes who have come out. And um, I know that you know Martina's people and, and Billy Jean King's people know about my work. Um, they're they're aware of it. And part of it is, um, I think, as a pro athlete, um, you know, there's this debate like who loses more when you come out. And if you're a pro athlete making a ton of money and kind of famous, and yeah, you lose something. But I, I don't know if that's as much as a 16-year-old who gets beat up and teased and has to kind of live life without any friends. I think there's this level at which um, we, we tend to sort of unfortunately privilege this one side of our world without giving kind of due attention to another kind of bravery. And that's kind of what I hope Fearless does. Do you see yourself as sort of an advocate for those young folks? I do, but I also realize that there's only, I'm not, I'm an artist, you know, there's only so much I can do to, to really be that advocate. I mean, it's hard because people have always asked, like, are you friends with people? And I'm like, well, I photographed 130 athletes and I think 70 or so don't ask, don't tell service members. So imagine all of those people now being my friend on Facebook or whatever it is, right? That it's that it's hard to kind of, I can barely keep up with my best friends from high school and college. Like, and adding these people to your life and feeling a responsibility towards them. And also, I mean, I check obituaries from the military all the time now, hoping that I don't recognize any names. And, and that burden um, is something that I've, I've probably created a really solid wall against, you know, not making sure that I, I don't let myself get affected to a point where it becomes destructive in my work. What kind of impact do you think that would have? I don't want to think about it, to be honest. It's really quite, it's hard. It's like, um, I always worry about that. I mean, the likelihood is there. I mean, people die every day in, in our military, and the chances of somebody who's either contacted me to be in a photo shoot or somebody I've already photographed. I, mean, I know at least 15 of the people you've seen in these images are, are overseas right now in, in war, and, and it's, that's that's difficult for me to think about. So this this is kind of a, it might be an odd question, but it's related to kind of what we've been talking about. The subjects of your the, these two series are gays and lesbian LGBT com community mm -hmm. folks. Do you see yourself as an artist who documents the gay community, or do you see someone a, a, a gay artist that's working on the subject? I mean, how, how does that the, your own identity? Yeah. play into the work you do, however you want to see I mean, that. Other photo series that I've done have not necessarily dealt with just the LGBT identity that I, I identify with, but also with you know, my identity as an immigrant. I mean, I'm not an immigrant. My parents are immigrants. Um, the fact that I'm Asian American, I mean, these things all play into itself as I conceive of projects. They've also affected the way the projects I've done have been re um, received by the world, I think. and. Um, I don't ever give that much thought to that question, but what you asked. I think I just, I make work that's compelling to me, that interests me, that, that moves me, and, and stuff I'm passionate about. And, and if for some reason, at this current moment in my life, these are the projects that drive me, then so be it. When I'm 50, they might not be, right? I might be so disinterested in the gay and lesbian community then, but, you know, I don't know. My friends joke I'll be photographing puppies or something. <laughs> you know, like, who knows? 
we're going to start wrapping it up in a second, but sure. uh, maybe one last question. As, as you know, today, the Pentagon has issued its report on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and whether the inclusion of LGBT folks in the military would uh, impact uh, combat readiness, so readiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, the report has come out and say, well, it really wouldn't have much of an impact. There's some implementation issues, but it's a general, generally uh, positive spin on the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't, uh, don't, don't, ask, don't Tell. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that, the current the state of this? I mean, is your, is your work influencing this debate? I mean, what, what do you think? I know my work, I know my work has actually been seen by a lot of the people involved in the debate. I do know that almost for a fact because of various things that have been shared with me about who's seen the work. I mean, I just got an email today from somebody who's like involved in the study like at the top level who just said thank you for the work I do. Um, you know, I, I feel like with all the really great press coverage I've received, um, I don't know, maybe I feel like that's, that's enough. Like, I, I don't think I'm ever that kind of person like a lawyer who needs to go into a courtroom and, and say I won or lost a case, but rather that, um, you know, I think all of you have an impact on the world, and whether you see that impact negatively or positively is something that you might not ever see, and that's okay, but just to recognize that power you have, you know, that's kind of what I see. Like, I'm just some random person with a camera, right, and to be covered by all these different news outlets and have my images shown around the world where millions of people have seen them. Um, it's not something I boast about. It's actually something that I go, oh my goodness, that's power. That's really, you know, from an individual. No one gave me a giant grant or, I, you know, I'm a very middle class background. And, um, you know, all of you should note that that's similar to what you are capable of. And I, I, I think that's the most moving thing I can think of. So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. A trip to our campus would not be complete without one of our sweatshirts. It's a little nippy out tonight. You think? Yes. <laughs> Jeff, you not only have a great eye, you have a great voice. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you so much. much. We it's appreciate it. Thank you. Please join us in the lobby. Uh, I'll be. Um, I believe I'll, I'll be out there, and um, I've got a couple of books that I can sign and sell and, and kind of be out there for. Um, I've kind of, I self-published all the books, and you can see them out there. Um, the CNN clip from last week depleted a lot of my stock, so I apologize. One of the books is sold out already, but, but um, yeah, if you're interested, I'll be out there. Thanks.